Let's talk about chocolate and what the contents of the chocolate uh, are when uh, we change different types from bittersweet to dark, and we change to this strange thing that's called coating chocolate versus just straight up chocolate. To understand that, I wanna start by talking about milk. Now, you might say, why are we starting by talking about milk? Milk is a really good example of a product that most people think is what comes naturally out of the starting point, but is in fact a blended product. So for example, I thought for a long time that whole milk was just the milk as it had come out of the cow, run through a homogenizer and a pasteurizer, and then stuck in a bottle. However, if that was the case, whole milk wouldn't consistently have 4% milk fat. You ever wonder how that happens? Well, cows um, on their own have a variety of milk fats expressed depending on time of year, depending on time of day, depending on what you fed them. And so it's not always exactly 4%, but the definition of whole milk is 4% milk fat. So how do we get there? We get there by the fact that all of the milk that comes into the milk processing plant before going into these bottles is separated cream from the milk and then reblended according to whatever proportions are needed for the product that is going out. So the 1% milk, the skim milk, the whole milk even, are all recreated from this cream that has been separated from the milk. So let's talk about how that applies to chocolate. This graphic shows a similar process flow diagram to the one I just drew on the last page for milk, except this one is for chocolate. We start up at the top with cocoa pods, which are what is harvested from the tree, and we end up down at the bottom with actual chocolate. What I want to call your attention to is what happens in this step here after the nibs are roasted and ground. What uh, you uh, were, what you saw in the video on the making of chocolate was that the chocolate then uh, proceeded straight on down the line into being chocolate bars. What is, however, more common when you're not a small artisanal Brooklyn-based chocolate bar company is that it takes this detour, this runaround shown off to the right here, where the chocolate or the cocoa mass is broken into its two components, cocoa butter, which is the fat, and cocoa powder, which is the solids. And in fact, you can use those and that to uh, turn around and reconstitute your chocolate and dump it back into the process at this step here. So you can actually turn these things around uh, if you want to and need to. And that, why would you do that? Well, if you are a small artisanal place in Brooklyn, you uh, want to express exactly the character of the beans as you purchased them. If, however, you are trying to make millions upon millions of consistent chocolate bars a year, you uh, work from having the component pieces so it can be blended precisely as you like every single time. And this is what allows us to make the different types of chocolate that you're all used to. In talking about types of chocolate, I'm going to bring in both the US definition of different types of chocolate and that from the EU because they grade the chocolate a bit more finely and make it easier to talk about. So let's look closely at these definitions. Let's start with the United States. Here we talk about chocolate liqueur, which is not alcoholic, but it is the mix of both solids and cocoa butter, which is the fat, from the original chocolate bean. Uh, whereas you see in Europe, they have the dry and the cocoa butter split out as separate ingredients. So what do we learn here? We learn that anything that is going to be named chocolate in the US must contain both chocolate solids and cocoa butter. If it only has one, that is if it only has some of the chocolate solids, it ends up with the name of chocolate E, or perhaps made with chocolate. You can't actually call it chocolate 
unless it has cocoa, uh, butter, and chocolate solids in it. With the exception, here we go, look at the exception down at the bottom, of white chocolate, which can keep chocolate in its name, even though it has no chocolate liqueur, but does have pure cocoa fat. Remember, the other stuff also has uh, cocoa butter in it as well, because that's a component of the liquor. In the EU, it's a little easier to see how this is broken out, because they have the solids listed separately from the butter at all times, and you can see white chocolate similarly defined as having the cocoa butter, uh, but nothing else, whereas uh, you can see, for example, dark chocolate as having the dry cocoa solids and the cocoa butter. Now, what, uh, what else do we need to learn from this? Well, the uh, behavior of your chocolate, um, its melting point, for example, and how you temper it depends on the quantity of the cocoa butter that is present. And we're going to look at the, the EU uh, because it breaks this out nice and cleanly. And you can see that we're getting different behaviors or different quantities of cocoa butter uh, as we have, well, I guess this stands to reason, right? Greater uh, composition of other stuff. Now, there's a space in the middle. You'll notice there's no cocoa butter here uh, in these spaces where it says things like family milk chocolate, or coverture milk chocolate, or even skimmed milk chocolate. What's going on in this space? Well, in this space, you'll notice we don't have a lack of fat. There's still plenty of fat. It's just that fat isn't cocoa butter anymore. If you go back and you look, and by the way, this is a thing that uh, can happen in the US. It just means we end up in the space of chocolatey. Um, when this happens, it means we've taken the cocoa butter uh, out of the process shown on the previous page, and what we've added back in is a different source of fat. We could, for example, use a vegetable oil. And why would we do something like that? Well, a few reasons. One is that cocoa butter is expensive. It's valuable. And so uh, people will also pay for it in hand cream or for making white chocolate. And so you can might you might be able to do better selling that separately than incorporating it in, in your chocolate. But that's not the only reason people might leave out the cocoa butter. You might want different material properties. For example, you might suspend your chocolate and sugar in a oil base in order to make something that's spreadable. Or you might be in Brazil, for example, where it is very hot and not every store has air conditioning. And in that case, they replace the, uh, the cocoa butter with a higher melting point, more wax-like substance that is still a fat. Uh, that way, the chocolate doesn't melt on the shelves in the stores of Rio de Janeiro. Finally, why else might you want to replace the fat? You, uh, if you've attempted tempering, you know it is kind of tricky. And so a nice reason to replace the fat in quote unquote chocolate might be so you can skip the tempering step. On the right, we see the phase diagram uh, or the time temperature phase diagram, as well as characteristic melting points of uh, actual dark chocolate. Remember that what you want in this case is what's called crystal structure five or beta is the desirable crystal structure. And why is that? Well, looking closely, we see that its melting point is right in there um, in line with human body temperature, which is 37. So it melts around 36 C. Whereas the other forms of chocolate melt much lower, make your hands all sticky might be what you want on a chocolate-covered strawberry, actually, uh, because then it won't be so ready to fracture at uh, refrigerator temperature. But um, nevertheless, well-tempered chocolate in the general case is down here with the higher 
melting point. And you can see it's uh, a bit harder to get to. In general, what you want to do is keep the chocolate liquid and then add seed crystals, which start the crystallization and move you straight here into beta. You don't really want to have uh, the transition you get when you put the chocolate straight into the fridge where you have some liquid chocolate, you cool it rapidly, and you end up with alpha crystals that may in fact evolve to beta prime crystals that may stay there or may over time evolve into beta crystals. And why don't you want that? Well, because each of these crystal formations is a slightly different shape and size. And as you go from uh, one to the other, your chocolate gets grainy because the size of the crystals change and becomes less shiny because the size of the crystals change. And in fact, because the beta crystals are a bit larger than their friends, the prime or alpha, they push some of the cocoa butter to the surface of your chocolate, giving you that spotty white, what's called bloom. Not bad for you, but not attractive. And so we'd all rather land in this beta configuration to begin with, and that's what the tempering process is intended to do. It's a pain in the tush, right? You appreciate that it is difficult to do this work. So how can we get around this? So for example, you might choose to go with a different fat that has fewer crystal forms and so therefore doesn't need to be treated in this complicated manner uh, with tempering, and also that has a higher melt temperature. And that way we know it won't make your hands all sticky. And that pretty much is how you get what we call coating chocolate, which isn't really chocolate, uh, because we have blended in a different fat. We also can impact this graph and this behavior by changing the amounts of the other things that are in solution. In that case, we still have cocoa butter, so this uh, process is still what's happening. However, the other solutes and things that are dispersed in the chocolate, like a greater degree of sugar or a greater degree of uh, milk solids, gives you slightly different material properties, not because they uh, melt or don't melt, but because their presence can impact the melt temperature of the chocolate. So that means you gotta look it up pretty much. What is the tempering procedure for the chocolate you are working with? Uh, because the, uh, <clears throat> the quantity of cocoa butter relative to the other products that are in there will shift things around. Another thing that is important is the milk, if you have milk chocolate, is in there in the form of solids. And so it can actually uh, burn uh, just like the cocoa solids can. Um, and also when you introduce water, it'll clump. So these are some of the ways your material properties are changed as you change the type of chocolate.